vulnerability breeds accountability and accountability breeds longevity. Mm. You show me a man that has been <laughs> vulnerable, that has men in his life that he's vulnerable to. It doesn't, it doesn't need to be a hundred. It could be three. It could be one, perhaps, that, that, that is that father figure that he knows has his best interest in mind. And, uh, and he allows that person to hold him accountable to the heavenly vision, to what God wants in every sphere of his life whether it's marriage, his children, his business, his church, et cetera. I guarantee you that that man will have longevity in everything he desires to do. Empower You podcast is devoted to bringing real world wisdom and encouragement to our listeners. We discuss a multitude of life principles and the process from an economic, cultural, and societal perspective. We believe that through tough conversations and shared wisdom, we can pave the path and leave a ladder for the future. Subscribe to our channel and let us empower you. For those of you who um, may be new to Empower You Podcast, Empower You Podcast is all about bringing real world wisdom and encouragement to our listeners, subscribers, fans, friends. And in this series, we're talking about men, right? We're talking about the struggles that men face uniquely um, and how we can overcome some of these things, how we can get better, how we can uh, confront these issues head on. And one of the things that um, we have to talk about if we're talking about men is our ability to one, see for see a vision for our own lives and our ability to believe in ourselves. Now, faith is is uh, um, the belief and the confidence in something. Right. And vision outside of a state of being able to see is the idea to actually execute a plan with some level of understanding and wisdom. And I think for men, um, we can struggle in either one of these areas or both. And so um, it's a vulnerable act to do any of these things. And so um, the little bit that I know is nothing compared to that of the wisdom and expertise of our guest. And I'm just so thrilled to have him here. Um, our, our guest today is Pastor Anthony Payton. He's an author, a speaker, um, the pastor of Come As You Are Community Church. He's a leadership and self-development coach. He's a serial international entrepreneur, a husband, a father, a grandfather, um, man, we could go on and on and on, but more importantly, he is here with us today to share with us some of his great wisdom, and we truly, truly appreciate it. How are you doing there, Pastor Payton? I'm doing a little better. I've been under the weather, but I, I did want to cancel this because we have done so, but, and so it is an honor. It is a privilege to be here with you, as always, my brother. Absolutely. Thank you so, 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 so much. And I'm glad that you're feeling a little bit better. Uh, I feel like any any small sniffle any now anymore is like reason to be very alarmed at this point. <laughs> so uh, I'm glad that you're well and you look healthy and you look uh, like you're glowing over there. Well, we, and, we're trying uh, to we're trying to do the Lord's <laughs> will. We're trying to do the that's Lord's right. will. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. So um, for those who don't know you as well as I know you, um, for those who are not familiar with Come As You Are Community Church, who maybe don't live in Indiana, um, who maybe live on the West Coast or East Coast or wherever, uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself in your own words? Um, and uh, then we can kind of dive into a little bit more of this topic. Sure. I, I have uh, been pastoring Come As You Are for over 26 years now. Uh, we started with about 12 members, uh, 11 ladies, one man, one man when I arrived there. The church was already in existence. I came in to uh, to preach, and subsequently uh, uh, they asked me to be the pastor. Uh, my wife and I have been there the, the, these 26 years, and uh, the church has grown in that time and done some tremendous things, both inside the context of the United States and beyond. So we're just humble servants. Humble servants, huh? All right, all right, all right. Uh, 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 that's awesome. You said uh, you've done some work in the United States and beyond. 
tell us about some of your your exploits uh, overseas and or some of your enterprises. I know that oh, for the, for those who don't know, you know, Pastor Payton is not only an astute you know minister and a leader, but he is also an astute businessman and real estate investor. And so um, he has of the ability to see things before they happen. Mm-hmm. And so um, that's that's one of the things that I think is so incredible about you, sir. And so, yeah, tell us a little bit about how you got into doing business overseas and, and kind of what that looks like for you. Well, I, I, I started going overseas. I think my first trip overseas were, was to Israel and uh, had a great time there. Uh, there, I, I, I stayed on a kibbutz. Uh, and kibbutz is like a, a, a community where everybody uh, that's a part of the kibbutz, everybody that's a part of that quote unquote family uh, uh, benefits from the revenue as well as works on the kibbutz. So, for instance, if you if you had a hotel, then you then the family members of that kibbutz worked at that hotel. Uh, the kids education was paid for. Uh, after they, especially in Israel, after they did their mandatory uh, time in the military, uh, they, their college was paid for, their health insurance was paid for, everything from the revenue ca- coming from that kibbutz. And the kibbutz had, you know, agricultural businesses, farms, or, or, or animals, or hotels, et cetera. And it was in that context that I, I, I began to rethink uh, how we do church and saw church more from a uh, a, a social entrepreneur perspective, uh, not only the, the, the spreading of the gospel, but what I call a social entrepreneur perspective. Uh, and and uh, so we had already, as a church, had some buildings, uh, the building that we were in and the building that uh, that, that we had a, uh, had a contract on. And so we began to lease out space for businesses that wanted to be on the southeast side of Fort Wayne at that time, for instance, when McDonald was driving on the southeast side, their business office was in one of our buildings. Uh, we had a mortgage uh, company that leased from us. We had a home, in-home health care facility that leased office space from us. You know, so all of that kind of uh, the genesis for that uh, birth out of my time in Israel on the kibbutz. And then, you know, I, I spent some time in Brazil. Brazil is, you know, I always say there, there, are, two, there are two places that always has my heart. That's one is Israel. I feel like I have more than just spiritual ties there. You know, it's almost like going to visit family. Mm. Uh, uh, and Israel and, and Brazil is the same way. Uh, Brazil has been a blessing, continues to be a blessing. We started uh, going there uh, probably 22, 23 years ago uh, and, 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 and started ministering there at various churches and one particular First Baptist Church, Rio Benito. Developed a relationship there with the members there and Pastor Daniel at the time. They're, they're, he's since retired and a new pastor has come on. Uh, his son is pastoring a church in Rio uh, de Janeiro. Uh, I was able to develop uh, relationships there that led to uh, uh, my shoe company, uh, that and et cetera. So those are some of the things that God has blessed me with the privilege of being involved with. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's incredible. And it's, it's very inspiring. You talk about, um, you know, just your, how could I put that? You know, it really does come down to your vision and your experiences other places that you allow to to continue to modify and add to the vision that you have you know when i think about church i definitely don't think of entrepreneurship when i think about church i do not think of um social impact in that way um but i think the way that you have you have molded um, the impact of Come As You Are Community Church is is not only is it uh, uh, just brilliant, but it also allows you to have a lot of horizontal growth, right? So you're able to spread across more areas and have more impact and sow more seeds that lead back to the church, right? And it doesn't Correct. have to be in a in a, in, a, in a quick way, it's just a long-term investment in the community underneath the guise or underneath the umbrella of, of serving people through 
uh, through your work in the ministry? Well, yeah, I think that 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 there's a, a an aspect of uh, social entrepreneurship within Scripture. I think Paul proves that when he was a tent maker. Matter of fact, he talks about when the money wasn't coming in, how he made tent because he didn't want to be obligated to any person. And so he made tents in order to uh, 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 subsidize, for lack of a better term, the ministry, the, the vision that God had given him. And, and the historicity of the African-American church has been, is one in which many businesses were birthed in the basement of the African-American church. Uh, you, you, Johnson & Johnson's, for instance, publishing Jet Magazine was birthed in the basement of a church. You know, though, so for us not to have our pulse and uh, on our hands on the pulse of the economic growth of our community uh, as a church, uh, in my opinion, uh, 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 defiles the history and the mm -hmm. call that God has for us. You said defiles the history and the call that God has for us. Man, yeah. those are strong words right there. No, I, I, I mean, I, I, I honestly believe that probably one of the most independent, the, ch the African American church by design in this country had to be independent because there was nobody to support it but those that were attending. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, for instance, I talked to Pastor Ken uh, Christman uh, and, and, and he talked about uh, Turner Chapel being the oldest African American church in our community. And they were doing great works and, and, and doing great things in the community. Uh, uh, but they couldn't even get a bank loan, even though they had the resources and et cetera. Wow. You know, so historically, the African-American church has had, depend, had, ha, has had to depend upon, A, one another, God, A, God, one another to get things done. And then it had to develop those relationships, as you said, horizontally, of, 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 of people of conscience, I like that term, of men and women of conscience who, who not only preach Jesus, but live Jesus. They not only had an orthodoxy, but they had an orthopraxy. They, they owned the practical application of the word of God in everyday life. They put it in shoe leather, as I like to say. And so that's what happened with Turner Chapel, for instance. You know, there was a, 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 a white lady who heard about what they was trying to do and, and represented them to the bank in order for the building and the things that they needed to do to become reality. So historically, we have to, that's a part of our history that many younger people do not know. And it's unfortunate that we that that we don't talk enough about that. You know, I I, I remember one of the things that 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 one of the times I visit Israel, and one of the most fascinating things was going to uh, the the wall there where they prayed. And when you walk to the, in the entrance of that wall, a, 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 in the court rather, there's a word written in Hebrew that simply says "Remember." The oral tradition for them is everything. And unfortunately, the oral tradition for us has subsided. And we don't tell our story. We don't own it. We don't tell it. And so what happens is, as the old African proverb goes, uh, until the lion has his own historian, the hunter is always the hero. And so what has happened by default, when we don't own our story and tell our story, we leave it to others to tell it and own it and therefore we don't our younger generation don't know about the the entrepreneurial disposition the, uh, of the african-american church but i can go on with this stuff Ooh, <laughs> listen you talking heavy i yeah. love it yeah. and i think because you know to be just blunt you know I, i've never seen I didn't experience church doing church the way that you all do. And I say, and, and please don't, you know, to, to not only to you, but then it's anyone else who, who is um, watching. You know, when I say church, you know, I, I really hope no one thinks I, uh, I'm minimizing of what course. happens in of church. Course. Course. I'm just saying like as a collective body from the time I was a young, young child to the, to the, the age that I am now, you know, I never experienced the kind of industry and enterprise of church um, until I started to meet 
folks like yourself who completely saw faith in a different way and use it um, not only you know, to impact people's lives and to put their principles and their values in shoe leather, as you mm -hmm. said, mm -hmm. but also to create more uh, um, access mm -hmm. and more leverage mm -hmm. to continue to mm -hmm. build and store resources in those times in which um, there are, are, are global pandemics. You know, you all fed thousands and thousands of people during the the pandemic and that's because of the leverage and the relationships that you had otherwise you wouldn't have been able to do that yeah yeah, yeah. and so i just i just it's inspiring to me to see faith taking this type of action especially in the black church and so that's you know which again you know brings us back to our our topic for today which is faith and vision mm -hmm. and i think for a, a a man such as yourself to have this kind of vision i think it does two things one it makes you a huge target right <laughs> yes, it <Vision. laughs> yes it does you know because yes, vision does. always precedes um some type of uh adversity i i 100 100 yeah and so you know to talk about you know your vision with with not only your ministry but your life um and and then also you know the faith that it takes that in the midst of the adversity in the midst of that isolation um how do you carry all of those things out do you feel like you know as as men i feel like we either run from having bold visions or we 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 put it under a, 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 a what is it a bushel or or you know we hide our candle because mm -hmm. we don't want to be exposed for thinking and being that vulnerable to this big idea. Do you feel like that's uh, uh, just a unique? male trait uh, and this is just my experience right you can totally correct me if i'm incorrect in this but i think i but for me i see a lot of men shy away from big visions um, well i don't think it's necessarily uh, a male trait i think people in general fall in that category do i will say that there are some nuances when it comes to men in general and when it comes to african-american men specifically that that take us that 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 ideology that 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 paradigm takes on a whole different dimension mm. in, in our lives uh we we being african-american men have the tendency we've we've been beaten down so much that that it becomes easier to take the road less travel it becomes easier to punch somebody's clock than to do what you need to own the clock you know, and, and have somebody else punching it and working for you. One of the things that has helped me, you know, and I and I know we all wired differently, but one of the things that helped me, you know, when I came to Christ, I came to Christ in, in 1983 in a jail cell, April 19th, 1983. And I made a decision that I was going to live a life of intensity that was not going to be second to the life of intensity that I lived for the enemy, for the devil. Mm. I was not going to phone it in. If I, if I did everything within my gifting and in my knowledge set, relationships, et cetera, in all those spheres to glorify uh, the world, to glorify the enemy, then I was going to take that same energy and, and to glorify God and what he wanted to do in my life. That was the first step. I I, I, I I realized that I was gonna live that type of life. And 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 I I believe that every man, here it is, every man has to make a decision to live, number one, courageous. That's the number one decision that a man has to make. That he is gonna live a courageous life, that he's gonna, he's gonna put everything on the line. He's gonna, you know, he's gonna leave it all on the court. I was listening to it. Iverson talk about Kobe. And one of the things he says, he says, Kobe was different. He said he was just different. He says, we would be at the club and Kobe would be at the gym. 
by himself working on stuff, you know. And, 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 and I think it takes that kind of courageous life, but it, you can't live courageous out of a vacuum. Cur that, that courageous disposition and decisions that you have to make has to come from a sense of vision, as you say. Uh, you have to have a personal vision and the idea of what the purposes of God is for your life. Vision, the, if you look at the etymology of the word vision, uh, it, it's the same word that we get our word video from. Uh, uh, so vision, if from a very pragmatic perspective, is a video clip of the future. It is a video <laughs> clip of what God has for you. <laughs> I like that. That was nice. So, yeah. And so when God gives you that video clip, if you would, when God says this is what the future holds, he may not fill in all the lines as what it's going to take in order for you to get there, but he's giving you a vision. Remember, the Bible says it was for the hope that was set before him that Jesus endured the cross. The, it, it was that video clip of what, what, what was on the other side of the cross that helped him to endure the, the pain and the suffering, to walk the Via Della Rosa, the path of suffering. And I think that once a man has vision, or if you would, purpose, and that purpose is matched with passion, and that passion comes with understanding the people and the place that God has assigned him to, then he makes a decision to live courageously as it relates to that purpose, as it relates to that passion, as it relates to the appreciation that he should have for the people and the place that he's been assigned to. And that's what I believe is critical in this whole thing. And that's what has been my modus operandi. And it's helped me because it, it is a lonely life. You know, you'll be you'll be misunderstood. People will say that that you think you're better than anybody else and you will make mistakes. But you have to be able to come back to that video clip. You got to play that sucker over and over again. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And and, and, and and connect that video clip with your purpose and your passion and appreciation for the people in the place that God has assigned you to. And then you make courageous decisions as it relates to that. And the second decision you make as it relates to that is not only courageous, but you make a decision to be obedient. You got to be obedient to the heavenly vision. First thing that God tells Joshua is to be courageous. Next thing he tells him to be obedient. You know, we have to be courageous. We have to be obedient. And the third decision every man has to make is he has to make a decision to live faithfully. You know, I am going to live faithfully. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to carve out this path. And because I realize that this is the path that I'm, I am supposed to run in, the lane I'm supposed to run in, I'm going to commit to run this race faithfully. And that's that, 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 has helped me tremendously. Mm, that's so good. There's so many things that you said there that are that are just absolutely um, very real. I think um, you talked about being courageous. And I want to start there. You know, I think men in general, we tend to think that um, being courageous means being the loudest in the room being courageous means being in control all the time mm -hmm. being courageous means uh dominating environments and conversations but i don't think that is accurate i don't think that is what being truly courageous means at, at, at least as i grow right as i continue to develop i don't see domination I don't see, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, not allowing situations to breathe, environments to, I don't see that as being courageous. Can you explain to me a little bit what you mean by being courageous in terms, in, in, in connection with, you know, your vision and how you're proceeding through life? Well, I believe that men are inherently designed by God to be courageous. Make no mistakes about that. I think when it comes particularly to African-American context and, 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 and with the, the, the male uh, context of that, uh, uh, 
we have been beaten down so much that we 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 are we back away from that courageous moment. Here's what I mean. I I, rem I remember I wrote this in my book. I remember uh, uh, growing up, and, and this neighbor of my grandmother's gave me a blue tick hound dog. Blue tick hound dogs were notorious for hunting. They knew how to hunt. And so he gave me this blue tick hound dog. And I was excited about having this blue tick hound dog to, to go out hunting. And so I grabbed my 410 shotgun and I'm going out, we're gonna hunt some rabbits, et cetera. And I go out and this and, and a rabbit jumps and the blue tick hound dog just sits there. When I when I when I held my gun up to shoot, he just ran away. And 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 I and I went back to the neighbor. I said, "Man, there's something wrong with this dog. It just it it, it won't hunt." It, 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 and, and this is what the neighbor said. I know we'll forget it. He says, "Tony, this I gave you that dog because the dog is only good for being a pet. It's gun shy." I said, "Gun shy? What do you mean gun shy?" He said, "This dog has had guns fired in front of it so much that just raising the barrel of a gun." cause it to run away and not hunt. And I think mm -hmm. that's what happens with us as men. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we have become so gun shy Woo. that our courageous disposition does not come to the forefront. And we, we, come, we become uh, scared and afraid of, 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 of losing. And here's the thing that I think is so critical. And I'm gonna say this, I know it may be off the, 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 the point. This is why I think that, 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 that the wife in a man's life is so important to him being courageous. It's, she, she, has the, she has the capacity to build that sense of courage up in him so that he goes back out and try even harder and harder no matter what happens. But what happens in many instances, unfortunately, that they become one of the main ones that beats him down. And so he been, he getting beat up out there on the workplace, out there in the, in the, in the world. He comes home and because he, he, things hadn't fell into place as quickly as she would like or et cetera, he gets beat up at home. And so he ends up feeling like a failure. And so he just settles and he doesn't, he doesn't live courageously. I, I remember listened to a, a, a workshop that uh, Warren Buffett and, and uh, 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 the founder of, of Microsoft did, uh, Bill Gates. And the, 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 the gentleman that was uh, uh, leading the workshop, the, the MC in the workshop, asked this question of them. If you were speaking to a young entrepreneur and you could give him one piece of advice, male or female, what would you say to them? Warren Buffett, without hesitation, I know I'll forget it. He said this, marry well. He says, your capacity for your dreams to come a reality hinges on the person you choose, choose to travel with you on that path. If they are not courageous enough to believe in what God has called you to do, you will fail worse or you'll get there by delay at best, marry well. And so I think for us as African-American men, we've so become so gun shy, to get back to the original question, we've become so gun shy for those two principal reasons that we don't hunt. We, we, we don't act courageous. We, we, we don't take risks. We just, we, we, we want to phone it in. We, we talk about what we want to achieve. We talk about that business. We talk about, I want my own company. But when it comes to taking risk, we won't do it, you know? Wow. And, and, and when you're on the outside looking in, it wow. looks like a person, you know, got it going on, but you don't know their story. You don't know what they had to sacrifice in order to get there. I sacrifice retirement money to start business. I believe so much that I took money from my retirement to do certain things. I believed in what I was doing for the church so much that I did certain things. I believe so much that when I first came there and they couldn't pay me, I, I quit my job when the church could only pay me $25 a week, $25 a week with two kids. So if you're gonna do anything great, 
you're going to have to start with a desire and a decision to live courageously. Oh my goodness, that was uh, that was a lot. So there are so many things I'm rushing through my mind right now um, that I that I really want to. Okay, all right, I'm gonna start here. So you talked about a man's capacity mm-hmm. to execute his vision mm-hmm. being dependent Mm -hmm. on who he takes with him on that journey. Mm -hmm. You know, we live in an environment in a society where everyone is praised. You're validated for doing everything yourself, for being solo. Mm -hmm. Um, And what you're saying is the exact opposite of that. Of course. And, And go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, well, what I mean is, is I just think that is so interesting because for me, all right, I'm just going to give my own perspective, but I think sometimes you could be so protective on that, 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 that dream, that vision, that little video clip that you got, that you hover over it mm-hmm. and you keep it warm and you keep it watered and you don't, that, that's, that's yours. Mm-hmm. It can be con- it can be traumatizing to even allow other people to breathe over it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so, when you talk about allowing other people to breathe life into you, to mm-hmm. to to encourage you to be uh, a hunter, to encourage you to hunt harder, to in- to see areas in your life where you are gun shy, because I think. No matter how courageous you are, you're going to have areas where you have to become less gun shy, right? Amen. And so talk to me about what that looks like, you know, because now, okay, because now let's say for the for the fellas watching this, for ladies, you know, who may be dealing with their man or whatever, you got a vision, right? Mm -hmm. But now being able to execute that vision being able to 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 live that vision fully. How do you start letting people into that? How do you qualify the the emotions and the and the principles that are important to not only execute just being a good man, which feels like a feat all by itself some days, but then also being a man committed to a vision and then also having other people you talked about places of uh, people and then a place you know having other people whom you're supposed to love and respect and and cherish as well how do you hold all of those things true all at the same time okay, i i think that I, I i think that one aspect of the people is the people that god has assigned you to that's connected to the purpose uh, 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 you know, God tells Abraham to be a blessing. And and if you read it in the Hebrew, he says, be a blessing. And as you are being a blessing, you will be blessed. So that's an appreciation for the people in the place that God has assigned you to. But God always assigns people to you. He always assigns people to you to help you birth that vision. And I think sometimes because we are so if you would, gun shot, we, 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 we don't let the right people in. And we don't let the right people in primarily because we don't operate in what I call a, a, a spirit of discernment. There is nothing I have achieved that I achieved by myself. There, will, there has always been critical people in my life that has helped me to carry that baton further down the road. Uh, When I came to Jesus Christ, there was a white Southern Baptist gentleman that led me to the Lord in Mississippi. When I felt like it was time for me to come back here and go to come here and go to school, he gave me a one way bus ticket and helped me get here. When I got here, my stepfather didn't want anything to do with my my Christianity. Then he want me to ride and work with him, even though we worked the same job at the same shift. Uh, This man sent me down payment for a car so I could get back and forth to work by myself and go and, 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 and go to school. When I 
when I transitioned to uh, when Sandy and I got married and 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 and, and she came, we became pregnant with our son, uh, uh, and I didn't want to follow the same footsteps that my dad uh, had done, who had not poured into me anything about being a man. Uh, uh, only Buck, the guy that led me, had done that. Uh, uh, I applied for a job at the college, uh, Fort Wayne Bible College. It was a, you know, on the job board at the college. And there's a gentleman by the name of Jack Fannin. He owned an engineering company uh, that did some work. He, he hired me to work on a machine there. And uh, he used to come in and just stand over me and watch me on that machine. About 30 days after being there, he came, he called, he said, I want to take you to lunch. I thought he was going to fire me because he was a Christian guy and he just wanted to give me my last meal <laughs> <laughs> and fire me. And he took me to on State Street, on, on State, and there was an Arby's there and it's still there. And he said, uh, I've been watching you. I, there's something in you uh, and I that I like. Uh, uh, you, 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 you're trying to live what you believe. I, and uh, I would really like for you to have the plant manager position at my company. Uh, uh, I just terminated the plant manager I got, and I believe that you would make a good plant manager, but you have no business background. I said, no, I'm going to school to be a pastor. I'm going to school to be a preacher, teacher. He says, yeah, but I have over 20 years of business. I can teach you everything you need to know if you take the job. And I, I said, you offer me the plant manager position of the company? Plant manager? Yeah. I said, oh, man, it's Harvard. I can't say no to that. So he, I took the job and Jack taught me business. My first deal that I had to do had to do with add hiring contractors to add 20,000 square feet onto the building. And I had never done that before. But he walked me through that process. He taught me what I needed to know, taught me about expediting parts, end time shipping, all that kind of stuff. And so wow. when I came, when I became a pastor, that business component that Jack taught me became vital. It became essential to everything that we would do. It became foundational for the social entrepreneur disposition that our church supposed to have had. What Buck taught me about being courageous and being a man of God became essential. And then there was another gentleman by the name of Steve Stroop, who was also a, a, a Marine, and he was an engineer as well. And I had three engineers in my life that was mentored. Two of them were Marine, one was not. But there were three engineers. I have no engineering background, but God sent me the disciplined men to help me discipline myself in order that I may stay true to what he called me to do, to help me think through the process. And I needed those type of men, those engineers, those 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 analytical, logical, uh, thorough thinkers. Mm -hmm. And that's what, uh, and so when I became pastor, Steve Stroop uh, came alongside of me, he used to pray with me every week asked me those tough questions about how was I, my relationship with my wife, how was my relationship with my children. I know you're doing this, you're doing that, you're in and out of the country, but are you keeping the, the main thing the main thing? And I think that that comes back to my point. A man has to have three types of men in his life, in my opinion, in order for them to help him birth that vision. Number one, he needs a Paul. He needs an older man in his life that's been there, done that, got the t-shirt that can help him see around the corner because he has the experience. Number two, he needs a Timothy. He needs a young man that he's pouring into. The reason that the Dead Sea is dead is because everything comes in and nothing goes out. The tendency for us is to take everything for ourselves and not pass it on. Yeah to others like yourself, younger men who who have who who showing themselves to be true and, and worthy of that. And then third thing, third man that he needs, he needs a Barnabas. He needs an encourager. He needs someone that just come that God has assigned just to encourage him uh, uh, when things are going bad. You know, and 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 though if he got if he has that triad and I would say that the, the older guy the, the, is, it acts almost like a father to him. 
You know, the Bible says not many of you are father. I've had that in Buck. I've had that in Jack. I've had that in Steve. I've had that in Pastor Tanae Jordan, who was that father who would not let me throw in the towel, wouldn't let me give up, would, 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 would say, no, you can't do it that way, etc. cetera. Mm. And that has, hey doc, you can't tell my story without talking about these men. You 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 you, you dismiss the depth and the breadth yeah. of the, of my story if you leave leave any of these men out, and I think that that's what men have to be. They have to put on the spirit of discernment, ask God to give them the capacity to, to discern who is to walk along with them with that. That is so good. That is so 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 good. I think there's so much vulnerability in 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 allowing yourself to be led and poured into and i think what you said about the dead sea is very very true for a lot of men especially um i think men by default become these vaults of trauma of disappointment of of secrets of of, of failures um even highly successful men even men who you wouldn't think you know if you're not careful you just become a a collection of all the things that um, that didn't go the way that you thought they were going to go or that hurt you deeply. And I think one of the, the misconceptions that people have about men is that we don't remember and store those emotions, mm-hmm. that we don't experience and still uh, suffer from different traumatic experiences or, or situations. And so, you know, when you talk about allowing people to, to speak into you, and being and operating from a level of discernment, do you feel like there is a a level of um, vulnerability, a level of of trust that has to be necessary? And you talked about this, you know, as far as being courageous. But for men who who maybe don't have you know that triad, who don't even know where to look for that, who are just now becoming aware that there is this small video clip that just keeps playing in their head how do you start the process of of becoming more courageous of allowing people to speak into you of not being just a dead sea of your past how do you start there you you have to be courageous in in terms of letting people in it is an incredible level of vulnerability Um, um, but it's necessary because vulnerability uh, uh, breeds accountability and accountability breeds longevity. Uh, that'll mm. preach right there. Mm. You show me a man that has been <laughs> vulnerable, that has men in his life that he's vulnerable to. It doesn't, have, it doesn't need to be a hundred. It could be three. It could be one perhaps that, that is that father figure that he knows has his best interest in mind. And, uh, and he allows that person to hold him accountable to the heavenly vision, to what God wants in every sphere of his life, whether it's marriage, his children, his business, his church, etc. You, I guarantee you that that man will have longevity in everything he desires to do because vulnerability happens as a result of what accountability vulnerability breeds accountability and accountability breeds longevity so you're right there has to be that and that's not creative out of a vacuum that's why i come back to this whole notion of discernment you know um, uh, i have been able to have that that has been one of my gifts i mean that gift parenthetically has been a part of my life even before i came to christ and after I came to Christ, I understood the gift even more why God would tell me when I was on the street, no, let it go. Don't, don't touch that. Leave that alone. Let him have it. Don't, it ain't worth it. Those kind of things. And, and he was actually, I found out later that if I did what I wanted to do, that I would have I would have ended up in trouble in a major way. So when I became, when I when, when I started walking with Christ, that gift of discernment. Uh, became more pronounced in my life. It, it was, it, it, it almost was prophetic in that term of God would say, you know, be careful with this person or let this person only know this much or that kind of thing. Because 
it's kind of like uh, 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 you, you have to have an antagonist. You have to have that person that, you know, you, they're always going to be Sam Ballots that are calling you off the wall. Some are going to be blatant and tell you to stop building. Some are going to do it subtly. But you got to have a person in your life that's on your side that you know that you can bounce that off of and tell you, nah, don't listen to any of them. Keep moving, keep forward. Don't you compromise in this area. It, it, it'll take you longer to get there, but the payoff is going to be better. You know, so I, it's hard for us as men to reach that level of vulnerability. But I say this, I, I cut my teeth, if you would, on the streets, whether it's 14th and T Street in DC or Liberty City, Miami, I, I, I live those streets. So I know what it means not to show vulnerability. But at the same time, come become, after I became, became saved, I knew that I could not achieve anything of significance if I did not have a level of vulnerability in my life where I would be able to sit down and be naked in front of a man with my emotion, how I felt, et cetera, about what, what I was going through, what, what was going, what I was going through at home, what I was going through at, on my job, what I was going through when it came to this video clip that I was trying to see to come to a reality. I needed that. And every man needs that. He needs to ask God to show him who that person is, who that father figure is, who that meant. You know where we get the concept of mentoring from? Mm -mm. There's, are you familiar with the story of, of, of Odysseus? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, the story of Odysseus is a very interesting story. Odysseus Lee goes off to fight the Trojan War. He's off for years. He leaves his son with a slave that he trusted. And he goes out to this, 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 this war and he fights this war for, for years, 20 plus years. It takes him 13 years even to make him back home. And his son, in the meantime, has grown up and became a man. And he's out searching for his dad as his, son, as his dad is trying to make his way back home. He left his son in the hands of a slave by the name of Mentor. Really? <laughs> oh, wow. And that is the etymology of the whole concept of having a mentor. It comes from that story. It comes from Odysseus leaving his son as a young child in the hand of a man he trusted to, 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 to help him become a man in his absence by the name of mentor. Well, help me, Holy Spirit. Wow. God left the left earth and he has assigned certain men to every man to help that man become a man so that when God comes back, that, he can, that man, he can find that man doing everything that God called him to do and every gift, and using every gift that he's assigned to him because he left a mentor, a bond slave of his to help him become the reality of what God has said. God says this, here it is. He says, I selected you before the foundation of the earth. I chose you and I created you for every good work. Paul says, you are heaven's, uh, you, 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 are, you are heaven's poetry. That's what the word in the Greek says. You, you, it says that you are poetry. When you move in the purposes that I have assigned you, that's poetry in motion. You are my poetry. And, and, and there are people that has helped, that God has assigned to you to help you become poetry in motion. Mm. That is so good. That is so good. Oh my goodness. Do you, oh my gosh. There's so many things that are coming through my head right now. You know, I don't think, I think it's hard for men to view themselves as poetry. I think it's hard for men to view themselves as sacred. I think it's hard to view them for men to view themselves mm -hmm. as being uh, valuable mm -hmm. outside of, you know, what we can manufacture for somebody else. And I think that is a real, I think that's what creates so much, um, such a gun shy individual. We because, have to. <clears throat> go ahead. No, you go ahead. 
Well, I think because if you can only be valued for what you can provide, even though men, even though we as men can for a long time portray a sense of invincibility, we always know mm -hmm. how finite we are. Mm -hmm. We all, everybody in the room could be fooled, mm -hmm. but we always know how finite we are. Mm -hmm. And when our entire value is placed on what we can provide, we then realize just how vulnerable we actually are. And I feel like society today completely devalues the divinity or the value, the, 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 the gifts that men have and in exchange for the commodities that men can provide. And so when you talk about men being poetry, when you talk about men being sacred, when you talk about men being divine and that there have been left specific men just to help you become that divine version of yourself, that just seems like a lot to ask for. That seems like, I've never even heard anybody say that. I'll be, I'll be 1000% honest. I've never even heard anybody describe men or, or us as human beings as being any level of that important or 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 divine or or any intentional plan being actually left for us to be great well you, you, you know in genesis there's a story of nimrod nimrod was this man who says i'm gonna build a, a, a stairway to heaven i'm gonna build a tower all the way to heaven this black warrior, we know that his, historically, that this was a black man who says, I'm going to build a stairway to heaven. I'm going to build a tower that will reach to heaven. And this is what God says. He says, let us go down and confound the languages because this man's imagination can achieve this. Good God of mine. <laughs> Wow. Oh, Doc, think of what God said. God said, I got to go down and get everybody talking a different language because this brother here, he just might pull this off. Wow. Think about the implications of that for us as men. Think about the creativity that he had that God says, I'm going to confound all the languages to keep this from happening. They ain't going to understand one another. I got to make it so that they don't even understand one another because he could pull it up. And I think we lose sight of that value that God places up on us. I was reading years ago about the story of a young man, a, a, a guy, he was cleaning an attic of a house that he had bought. He cleaned this attic, attic out and he, and he came across this painting wrapped up in newspaper, you know, just strolled up there in the attic, didn't know what it was. He unwrapped it. It looked like it might be something. Before he decided to throw it away, he took it to an antique dealer, and it ended up being one of Picasso's earlier work, worth millions, over a hundred million dollars it was worth, sitting up in an attic wrapped up in paper oh, wow. because the person who had it did not know its value. You better help me here today. And I think in many instances, because we, are, we, we become so connected to the world's vision of who we are, that we don't have the value that we should have of ourselves. It isn't arrogant. I'm not narcissistic because I believe in my value. I'm not arrogant because I believe in that value. Scripture said, let no man think any more of himself than he ought. He doesn't say, don't be, don't be walking around thinking that you're nobody. He says, just don't be bragging about it. You are <laughs> value. You are, uh, I left the portals of glory, wrapped myself up in flesh, walked the Via Della Rosa, the path of suffering, died outside the city gate, went down into a grave, hung around 40 days after getting up from the grave to make sure that the disciples understood that I had resurrected, went back to heaven, stripped from myself demonic forces that tried to keep me from getting back, went back and presented the blood on the mercy seat just because the Father had value in you. And then you gotta sit back 
and not see your own worth, your own value? You're gonna let somebody downplay you so you can get along with them? So you can have friends? Mm. You're gonna sacrifice your vision, your goal, your dream, so you can get along with somebody? No, the devil is a lie. I'm not gonna do that. And I'm not arrogant. I don't think I'm any better than anybody. Matter of fact, I know I'm not better than anybody, but I'm certainly not any less than anybody. So I think we have that to part. come to that, that, <laughs> yeah, that part. We have to come back to the, where we see the value that God has placed in us as his creation, as his yeah. men. And, and when you begin to value yourself, you will, you will bump, God will send you people that will add value to that, that will see that value and help you elevate that value to a priceless uh, 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 picture of, 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 of who he's created you to be and what he's called you to do. Now, from there, you see behind me this, this whole thing, FIT fit, because I believe there's only in that construct that you become fit, fearless, intentional, and transformational. You will never be fearless if you never see your value. You'll never be fearless if you never understand your purpose and the video clip that God has given you. You'll never be fearless if you don't have the passion. You'll never be fearless if you don't appreciate the people in the place that God has assigned you. You'll never be fearless if you don't appreciate the people that he has assigned to you. You will never be fearless. You will never tell a joker, no, I'm not doing that. You're not gonna talk to me that way. You're not gonna call me to come off this wall. I may have lost this one. Yeah, what's, what's, this, what's the rapper said? Uh, 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 I think it was, uh, 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 what's his name? Nipsey Hussle said commitment. Yeah. <laughs> commitment? What is that? Dedication. <laughs> dedication. That's it. Dedication. That 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 blue pill in the matrix. Dedication. That comes as a result of you understanding your value and understanding your purpose and having the passion that goes along with that, an appreciation for the people in place that God has assigned you to, an appreciation for the people that God has assigned to you. Then you become fearless, and then you be, begin to make intentional moves. Now, you're not just shooting an arrow and hoping to hit somewhere. You're intentionally trying to meet the right people. You're intentionally going to the right places. You're intentionally hanging around the right people so that you can learn and glean and become what you want to be. And then you become transformation. Hmm. Oh my goodness, there's so much. I'm gonna play this back a few times. Listen, if you all are not already following Anthony Payton, if you all are not connected with Come As You Are Community Church, um, you need to go ahead and do so right now. There's gonna be a link in the show notes. There's gonna be a link for this in the video. Um, absolutely connect with 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 Pastor Payton. Um, if, if nothing <laughs> in this, hour or so that we've been on here resonates with you i really don't know what to tell you because 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 pastor payton is is completely moving in in his purpose at this moment and uh it's my honor to provide a platform for it to happen um because as much as it is for me it is also for you you're not here by accident whether you're watching this on live or in in, in a replay or even in a short clip uh somewhere on social media you are meant to be valued and to value yourself um, more than you do at this very moment. And so I, I I just am so thankful and blown away as always by by the way that you allow um, God and the way you allow your conviction to work out through your your the way that you live. It's just it's incredibly inspiring and I'm so thankful for it. You know, there's only one thing I would ask for you before we wrap this up. I know I kept you long. But, you know, we got to have a thought exercise for those young men who, you know, they might be flustered. They ready to run through a wall. They don't know what to do. They, What can they do right now to start to become more fit, to start to live with more faith and vision? What can they start doing right now? Well, I, I can only I can only connect the dots as it relates to my experience. I've been where they are. I've tried uh, uh, the shortcut, and, and, and I, all, I preach this 
shortcuts make long delays. Mm. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they make long delays. So I understand what it's like to be tempted to take the shortcut, try to get there, et cetera. For me, it all began, the genesis, the metamorphosis of my life started when I surrendered my life to God. I surrendered to him. I told him, whatever you want, I'll do it. However you want me to do it, I do it. You give me the strength to do what you call me to do, I do it. It starts there. It, for me, it starts with that personal relationship with him. And once I understood that, once I surrendered to that, then I began to understand my unique purpose and his plan. Uh, and, 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 and that, that, that surrender has taken me on a journey that I never thought I would ever go. And I never thought I've ever be in some of the rooms that I've been in. I never thought I would ever go to some of the places that I've gone. I never thought I would be able to do some of the things that I've been able to do for his glory. But it began with that surrender. Second, I think the person that they have to find a mentor. They have to find a father figure. They have to begin that once they surrender, they say, God, I need somebody to disciple me. I need a mentor. I need someone that you have assigned to me to help me walk this out, that can hold me accountable to this, that can that 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 will won't let me give up on you or me. Cause it's gonna be hard. It's gonna be difficult. I'm not gonna sit here and paint you some flower bed of ease. Uh, there have been some times where I wondered, okay, God, let me do something else. I want to, I, I can't do this. I don't want to put up with this. And I've had people in my life, men in my life, that slap me upside the head and say, are you crazy? You come too far. You, you got too much behind you to let this world blind you. That's I've had right. that, you know. And, and I thank God for men like Pastor Tanae Jordan. I thank God for men like Steve Stroop and Buckman and, and Jack Fanning and others who have been strategic in my life and helping me uh, uh, with that. And then I think that number, the third thing, the most important thing is, you know, you, you, you gotta begin to see who's in your corner in a broader sense, not just an individual, but the group that you're around. You show me who your friends are and I'll show you where you're going to be five years from now. You show me the people you're listening to and I'll show you who you, you show me the people that has your ear and I'll show you what you where you're going to be five years from now. And, and then one of the hardest things sometimes for men to do is divorce themselves from relationships that they've known that have been comfortable for them for all their life practically. They, the fear of losing and leaving people behind it's paralyzing to men at times because it was such a, a a comfort for them. They 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 knew that they could walk in that space and somebody knew their name and 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 and, 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 and laughed at their jokes, etc. But here's the problem with that. Here's what I say, and then this is this is it. People will always say once you make that decision that you change. Man, he done changed. They said that to me, I don't know how many times I said it. Man, he changed. And I had one person say, man, if, if he was white, he wouldn't even be speaking to us. You know, he, he, he's changed so much. And here's what I say. I said, the problem is not that I changed. The problem is you didn't see me switch lane. Mm. You, didn't, you didn't understand how I was riding. You didn't understand how I was rolling. As much as I tried to get you to understand where I was going, you didn't believe I could get there. So when I switched lanes, you didn't even take notice. Now you're taking notice because I'm moving ahead. Mm -hmm. You got to be prepared to live with that. You got to be prepared to leave some people behind. Now, Joseph said this. He said, what you meant for bad, God meant for good. You sold me into slavery, you sold me out, but God used what you did to send me ahead of you to preserve life. So I'm leaving the door open for you. I'm not just gonna kick you to the curb, but I can't slow down because me reaching my destiny 
it's as much about my life as it is your life. Because once I get there, I may be just very person that God has assigned to preserve your life. So that's what I would say. Mm-hmm. Surrender. Find a mentor and separate. Surrender. Find a mentor and separate. Surrender. Find a mentor and separate. Wow. That is, uh, that's incredible. That's just absolutely incredible. Thank you so, so much. There's so much um, that, you know, I, I just, there's so many things that you said that are not only validating, um, but that also just make a lot of sense uh, for different places that I've been in my life, um, as well as things that, you know, you, you still trying to process, you know, I think sometimes men, we get caught up processing. I want to say this to you, man. You know, I, I've said this to you privately and I'll say this to you publicly. And I will say this uh, uh, until God takes me home. You are an incredibly gifted young man. You know what you want to do. God has assigned you for now to Mayberry. Mayberry is very different. <laughs> Absolutely. Mary is very different. I ain't no, don't make no mistake about it. I understand what you're going through. There's two dangers in Mayberry. One, you become like Mayberry. Or two, you will uh, 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 stop dreaming. Mm. And therefore, you don't understand the, the place that Mayberry plays in your life. You got an incredibly gifted young man and God has so much for you to do. So he's going to have to take you to to sit you at tables and put you in rooms that are bigger than where you are so that you could do what he wants you to do wherever you are for his glory. I, I, I'm i looking forward to sharing our podcast with you on Monday at 7. We'll be sharing your, 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 your interview with you on Fit Conversations. You know, and I'm I'm I I, I, would, I went back and listened to some of the clips earlier, and I just you, there's so much truth and so much wisdom, just <laughs> sitting down. You know, I said this: young people today are uh, young, creative people are the new superheroes. I'm I, I I'm I'm owning that, and you are one of those That's superheroes right. in our community. And I thank God for you, man. Absolutely, absolutely. How can everybody get in touch with uh, with you? How can they get involved with with uh, Come As You Are Community Church? How can they listen to Fit Conversations? Um, is there some kind of way they can connect with you personally, send you some thank you notes? They can, can send they me something at A-S-U-R, the number two, at me.com. That's A as in Anthony, S as in Sam, U as in Underwood, R as in Roger, the number two, at M as in Mary, E as in Edward.com. They can also phone the church at 2603, uh, 260, I'm sorry, 447 6036. 260 447 6036. Log on to the website, kayak, C A Y A C C dot O R G. Wow. Wow. Pastor Peyton, as always, thank you so much for thank over you, delivering, for <laughs> over enlightening, for 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 consistently being just absolutely incredible and you know one of a kind, truly. And bless uh, you, bro. I'm grateful you. for you. Thank you. All right, y'all. Y'all all know right. what to do. Um, thank you again so much for all those who are watching. We appreciate you. We're gonna have another episode next week. Like I said, we're gonna try to do at least one live stream a week on Wednesdays. Um, So just be looking out. This week is Pastor Peyton. Make sure you connect with him. Uh, Again, we thank you so much. And uh, we're gonna see y'all a little bit later. Y'all take care. Empower You Podcast is devoted to bringing real world wisdom and encouragement to our listeners. We discuss a multitude of life principles and the process from an economic, cultural, and societal perspective. We believe that through tough conversations and shared wisdom, we can pave the path and leave a ladder for the future. Subscribe to our channel and let us empower you.